Art can be a weapon for change, and we artists have the ability to wield it at will. Each exposure contains a piece of eternity. Hey, welcome to the Street Shots Photography Podcast. This is Antonio. And this is Ward. And hello, Ward. How are you? I am well, Antonio. How are you? I'm well. Yeah. Getting, I'm really excited to, to be sitting with you tonight because uh, we have a very special guest. I don't know who's special. All our guests are special. They're all guests are special. All guests are special. Uh, today, yeah, we're going to be talking with uh, Shane Balkowicz, a uh, wet plate colonial photographer from, what is his location again? Sorry. Bismarck, Bismarck, North, North Dakota. Dakota. I don't want to do too long of an intro because the this uh, this interview might be a little long, so maybe we should just get to it. What do you think? I think we should just press play. All right, let's go. Shane, thank you for thank you so much for uh, joining us on um, Street Shots tonight. It's it's a pleasure, Antonio and Ward. Yeah, and uh, so I'm going to go and say I'm kind of uh, embarrassed that I didn't know your work before I met you on Frames, <laughs> on okay. on the on the uh, uh, Facebook group Frames, and I, I looked at your CV on your on your website, and I'm like, where? Why am Why am I not? seeing your stuff like why haven't i seen it and so i'm actually grateful to have met you on on frames and seeing your work there um because you're posting you know it almost seems like you're posting every day or every few days or something like that and all the stories behind your pictures but um you know i i resonate a lot with your work i see the i see you're you're a um, wet plate collodion photographer i think you call yourself yes. an ambrose type Ambro typist, which means immortal impression in Latin. Yeah, that's and a historic uh, historic title. Yeah, and uh, I, 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 I'm sort of starstruck by you being here. I'm also a little tongue tied, <laughs> but the I'm here um, for you, buddy. I'm here for you. Yeah, yes. <laughs> well, we're just gonna <laughs> save me. <laughs> but what really set me off to to want you to be on the show was the, uh, there was a portrait you did of. Um, uh, Native American man. Let me see if I get the picture here in front of me with his with his name, um, Corey David Annis Graycloud, uh, mm -hmm. who's Lakota. Yes. And uh, you know I had been seeing your pictures, but that but that image um, I locked my eyes onto it for for as long as I could and um, felt something. And so I reached out to you and asked you to be on the show and you know, you gracefully uh, acknowledged and said yes. And and I just wanted to get you on here and. Just talk about what you're doing and how you're doing it and why you're doing it, you know. Um, but I also wanted to talk to you myself because there's some stuff that uh, I couldn't quite explain. And I think um, you, you might, uh, you certainly might understand that because about how you found this technique. So before we get into that nitty gritty, I want to ask you for my audience, if you could just explain what you do. What, what is wet, plain, wet plate collodion photography or uh, just describe yes. it. Yes. Yeah. It's it's an archaic form of photography. Um, um, dates back to 1851 um, with Frederick Scott Archer and in, invented the process in 1851. So um, I'm an amber typist, like you said. Um, uh, maybe some of your listeners would have heard of a tin typist or a tin type. Um, they were very common as well. So people would capture silver images on a piece of tin. Um, and um, they're the same exact process. A lot of people get confused between a tin type and an amber type. But, they're exactly the same process. The only difference is, is what we're loading, what we're pouring the clothing onto. So I'm pour, I happen to pour onto a piece of black, black glass. Um, I've got a piece right here. So um, I get big 24 by 24 inch sheets of this black glass, something that you quality of something that like at a church at a church window. And I cut it down to size and I fit it into my camera after I uh, pour um, what is known as a clothing onto the plate, Clodian. I know most of your listeners. Do you, do you post a video or just always audio? No, it's always audio. So you always, always describe it. it. Yeah. So I, I I'm holding up a, I'm holding up a bottle, a, a bottle of uh, amber 
uh, fluid, which is called collodion. So um, collodion had a medical application as a nurse. Um, I found this out. So if if we were on the, the planes or something, Antonio, and I was a doctor and, and you cut your arm on a piece of barbed wire or someone slashed you with a sword or something like that, um, I would have ether with me because as a physician, um, I would be putting people to sleep for amputations mm-hmm. or pulling teeth or anything. Anytime they had to put someone unconscious, I would go to ward by gunsmith and I would get some gun cotton. And the gun cotton um, is made out of cellulose. I would stick some cellulose into the collodion, into the ether, and I would make what's called collodion, which is kind of like this liquid glue kind of thing that Frederick Scott Archer knew about. So you get cut. I take this bottle of collodion. I've done this in the studio where I cut my finger on a piece of glass and I'll go and b- grab my my collodion and pour it in my wound. And it is, it's like a liquid bandage. Burns like a, a bugger. Really? <laughs> but it, it seals and, and stops the bleeding. So I've used it myself in my, um, in my studio here. So Archer knew about this liquid bandage from the Victorian era, and he had to figure out how to get silver molecules onto some kind of substrate, which was either tin or glass. And he was doing prints and, and clear glass. I'm doing positives, by the way, um, mm-hmm. black glass positives. So when you look at these images behind me on the wall, these are for viewing. Um, he would have done, which most photographers would have done back in the day is shot on clear glass. He would have made negative so he could make multiple contact prints. It was the only way that you could duplicate something. So the beauty of why I shoot, people ask me, why do I shoot glass over, you know, uh, black glass over clear glass is because I have no interest. It's for me, it's all about the final image and the final object. And I have no interest in the final object being a contact print. Because I, I just always feel like if I do one print for you, Antonio, then I do one print for Ward, and I do a third print, the third print, the two previous prints become less valuable, and this kind of scenario. And this is just my own, I, I, I'm not talking against people that do contact prints, because I've, I've done it myself. I just have to give you my slant on why I particularly do this. I like these one-offs. So these, these plates on my wall here in my studio, you break one of them, there's no replacing it whatsoever. It's, it's gone forever. Um, so that's what I really like about this one-off um, unique object that can't get, can't be replaced. So Archer figured out that if he added bromide salts to the collodion, he can get silver molecules to jump out of a silver nitrate bath and impregnate collodion on the front of this substrate, which would be tin or glass, and um, expose in the camera, developed, rinsed, fixed, rinsed, and dried. Um, these images are made out of pure silver. What's beautiful about silver, there's two really fabulous properties of, of wet plates in particular. First of all, their archivability. These images are made out of pure silver on glass. They will be here a thousand years from now. You can't say that about any other pigment or ink or paint or anything else we do to make images. Um, you know, cyanotypes and Van Dykes and all these other processes, they do not have the, um, the ability to uh, withstand hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years without degrading at some point. When the students come in here on Wednesday from Bismarck State College, I'll tell them, if you take the silver spoon and put it on the ground and come back 500 years from now, what do you have on the ground? And the answer is a silver spoon. Mm. And that's why these images will be here long after we're all gone. And especially, um, you know, if they're in an archive properly in an acid-free sleeve, I've I've got my work in over 40, um, in, in 40 different museums around the world. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. So that, that's the one first property of wet plate. And the other uh, really fascinating property is the resolution. So we're writing in my molecules of silver. Um, mm-hmm. It takes about 2 billion molecules of silver at the tip of your finger. Just visualize it with the human eye. Um, if you can put your head around that resolution. So all of these, <laughs> all of these photographs can be put under a microscope and a very high powered microscope. And you cannot get to the pixel of grain that makes them up. You need an electron microscope with 10,000 plus power to be able to visualize the molecules of silver that I'm using to create these images. So these, those two things alone, the, the resolution and the archivability, I mean, it's just a beautiful and fabulous process that we abandoned in 1885 uh, around that time mm-hmm. for um, dry plates. And, and we did that for no other reason why humans abandoned every, everything um, for simplicity and cost and something you know, it's new. Con- yeah. It, yeah. It new and it's easier. You know, it, it freed the, the dry plate process, followed the wet plate. It freed the photographer up from the dark room. When I make a plate and I pour that collodion that I just described to you onto a plate, um, I've got only minutes to get that exposure and get it all done. I, if it dries, you know, and I've been out in 103 degree weather, 
down in South Dakota capturing the Grand River where Sitting Bull um, took a bath and drank from. Um, you know, you, in 103 degree weather, you do not have much time when um, something with ether and alcohol is drying in your hands. So it's a very daunting task. When when I captured that, that photograph of Greta Thunberg standing for us all, I had to go down to Standing Rock Reservation and I'm in the middle of the field with a black box that I climb into my torso in and pull a shroud around me. And I got to do all my chemistry in the, in the field. And um, so in 1885, dry plates came along, freed the photographer. You go into the field with these dry plates that you buy right, right, right from Kodak Eastman or other, or other providers. They already had the emulsion on it. You just keep them in the dark, do your exposures, keep them in the dark and bring them back. And you could come back six months later and develop them and, and, mm. and, and do something with them. That's not the case with wet plates. So it, would, it was a um, convenience thing is why people just abandoned this. But it, it's still not a good enough reason for me. But I'm a... I'm a, uh, an advocate for this process. Mm. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, it's amazing. And, and you know, we're going to ask you about uh, uh, your feeling on the value of the process. And you've definitely, you've definitely shown us that and told us that. Um, I want to step back a bit. And I've seen you uh, in a TED Talk talk about that you were, don't consider yourself a photographer. And going back further than that, like you, then how you had discovered this process. And I understand that you're like a native Bismarcker, right? You, yes, you were born, born, and raised. born and raised. Yeah. So what can you tell us about your background that, that led to this creative force that you have and your passion, particularly for this, this arcane process? Where did that I come from? What's in your background? Nothing. No, absolutely nothing. No, 44 years of age, um, had no creative outlets uh, whatsoever um, and just found photography. Never had an interest in photography, never had a camera. My dad didn't have a camera. Um, you know, obviously I had a camera on my phone or, you know, we all, we all have like a Kodak back in our history, but I never was a, you know what I mean? Like I got a camera today, this is, I'm gonna load it with film and I'm gonna take some pictures. I never intently took pictures in my life until 2012. I mean, family little snapshots and stuff, we all do that. But I'm, I'm talking about, I'm getting a camera, I'm going to do compo a composition today. I'm going to go capture something and then I'm going to share these photographs with someone never happened to 2012. So um, I don't, I don't know where it came from. I've always loved the arts. I always loved history. I, I think that the history thing, I've always loved history. Um, so I think the, you know, when I started reading about wet plate clothing and, and, you know, they just got very, very romantic and, and, and nostalgic in my mind. And, and it just seemed like uh, something I would like to do. I was searching to answer your question also, Ward. Um, I, I run Bulk Witch Enterprises, which is an online company um, since 1998. And, and I think I was killing myself, um, you know, with that job and, and all the technology and it's an online company and all that. And, and I, I don't know, I think I was rebelling against something. I just, I had to find something else that was, um, more significant. I knew at that point, being very successful at that point, that this was this can't be what this is about. Like this is not what um, I'm here for. Um, bottom lines and profit and loss statements and and all the all the stuff that goes along with that. Um, so I, I knew I was searching. I, I I can honestly say I was searching for something. I was, you know, I was making marionettes for my kids out of clay and some wire and some string and some wood. Um, I dabbled in painting, but I, I, if you looked at any of these products, I have, I, I'm talentless. And I, I, I tell the students that when they come out, I'm, I'm talentless. I have no talents. I stand before you with no talents whatsoever. And, um, and, and that's where I think you're picking up a little bit early on um, to uh, word. You mentioned me not considering myself a photographer. I wouldn't call myself a photographer because not because I thought it was better than photographers. I just didn't want to insult anyone. I mean, really, I mean, it was like, what are they? You can't, you're, you can't, it was like this holy grail, like to be, call myself. It took me, oh, my friends just kept hounding me. Um, it took me five years, five years of creating works. And then my, you know, my very close friends, uh, mentors of mine and people that, you know, stood behind, stood by me and helped me along the way. They said, well, Shane, when are you going to acknowledge that you're a photographer? And then I'd post something, Shane, you're a photographer. I'd hear it over and over <laughs> and over. And eventually it just beat it into me that at some point I became a photographer, but it wasn't out of, um, 
It wasn't out of any other reason, but I did not want to insult anyone because I didn't understand f-stops. I didn't understand exposure times. I didn't understand lighting. I still don't understand. I still don't understand, you know, flash photography. I mean, there's, and, and I, and I, I stay naive on purpose. It's like, I don't, I just take what I need. And for me, it's all about the final image. And as long as I'm chasing the final image and I'm, and I can be happy with the final image and not every final image, but you know, if you can get the couple of final images a month, um, you know, that's what keeps you coming back. So it's been, it was big, huge leaps in the beginning where I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I mean, how do you build a dark room, never standing, standing foot in a dark room and someone showing you a dark room? I had never been in a dark room and I had to create my own dark room. I had no, I, I mean, I had no idea about the red light. I mean, I, about trays and rinsing. I had no concept of any of that. So it was all trial and error. And it was, you know, I was in this about a year and a half or so before the first photographer ever came into my, into my studio. And I was like, I can remember that day. I just dreaded it. Cause I was like, they're going to find out that I'm a fraud. <laughs> like I mean, the, the gig is up like this about guy, the end product. What, in the, what in the heck is this guy doing? You know what I mean? So mm. um, my first studio, I got to share with you. I mean, th this big natural light studio here that you guys have probably seen in the documentary or whatever. Um, that's not where I started. I started at a back warehouse of my, of my corporate headquarters with no windows and I didn't have a separate dark room. So the entire 5,500 square feet warehouse would have to go dark and I'd have red lights on. Oh, really? My employees, oh. my employees were packing boxes with these red headlights on. So on Fridays, <laughs> and I only created on Fridays, I'd look over and here's these little people, these people walking around oh, with these red funny. headlights on there. They'd be, you know, they'd be um, oh, moving boxes around and stuff in the dark because, you know, and then we'd have to lock the door because the FedEx guy would come in and I'm in the middle of a plate and he'd open up the door and natural light would come in. I mean, my sitters would sit there and wait for their picture in the dark. And then I would pop on these, un, uh, these UV bulbs and just blow them up, you know, blow their <laughs> eyeballs out. Yeah. And it was just like, but I did the, the, the lesson and I hope I can pass this on. The lesson yeah. is you just do what you have to. Was it convenient? Was it, was it a little kind of goofy? Yeah, of course it was. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So, but you just do what you have to do. And I've always said, it doesn't matter what I, all if I got to do five jumping jacks and a couple of handstands before an exposure to get that exposure right, I'm going to do it. I don't I don't care. And everything that precedes the image doesn't matter. All that matters is the image at the end. Yeah. It doesn't matter what happened to get to that image. It doesn't matter whatsoever. So in in the things I've listened to and seen your 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 first exposure to the wet plate photograph was the one of the motorcycle that your friend yes was from making? paul delorean's a friend of mine now um yeah paul delorean's he was a he runs the vintage which is the largest the world's largest motorcycle uh blog and um he was traveling across the country and and i have the photograph on my computer and i go i share the photograph oh, yeah. every once yeah. in a while it's i always joke that i wish it was it was just a, a photograph and two autofocus people behind it and I always joke that I, I should have, you know, what, why would that draw you in? Like, you know, why would that draw you in like a, a, a wet plate of like a nude woman or some kind of beautiful landscape or something? Then I could say, well, this is why I <laughs> practice wet plate, but it was nothing like that. So, and yeah, um, what, it, I mean, I just realized this, that it's a, it was a, uh, uh, an image of a machine, right? I mean, mm -hmm. and so yeah. what, what was it about that machine, the way it was presented in that format that, started this sounds like that's the spark that started the obsession and it's not, not the right word but this oh, journey that you have now my wife would she'd use other words other than obsession yeah, okay. <laughs> it's 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 way it's beyond like, people oh, it's, it's interesting. way beyond said, anything like a hobby or something yeah you said it's not it wasn't a, you know it wasn't a, a model it was it was a yeah. machine and so obviously it's the process and so and the reason why it I'm had a lot of nuances though the image had a lot of nuances and i saw and i have a picture of him pouring the actual plate that i that of mm -hmm. the plate that I was drawn to. So I have this history and, and he actually did this. He hired a writer to write this wonderful story about how when I, him and I, how his one little photograph inspired me and tells my entire story. It's, it's out there. And um, it was, it, but this was six years after we did this. He knew the story. I, every time I do an interview, I'd say his name and he, he'd hear about it. And <laughs> I, I, he, I keep thanking him and thanking him and thanking him and thanking him. I said, Paul, you, you get, you might as well get sick of it. Cause I'm going to keep thanking you yeah, because yeah. if it wasn't for you, none of this would be possible. And it's just the truth that I, I just feel grateful to him. 
and um, and and that's it. But he did tell me he said there's no way that a non photographer will ever teach themselves wet plate Claudia. Mm. Mm. And well, within 45 days, and, but he wasn't being mean. He was no, just, he was just being he was being honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, he'd be he was being honest, and and uh, he knows that story, and this is how, this is how I remember it. And, um, and he wasn't being mean. It just but within 45 days of that. Um, I made my first exposure on October 4th, 2012, a picture of my brother, Chad. It's a great picture, by the way. A great photo mm, of your brother. Thanks. Um, and, and I ask you this because, uh, again, I, you know, I've been exposed to bad word. <laughs> Not a good pun. Sorry. Mm -hmm. You know, seeing wet plates and uh, diving into history of photography. So I know about this. But, but when I saw your work, pop up on frames and again specifically that image of um the the one i just described before the mm -hmm. Native american man I, I feel like i got sucked into your world somehow or or um pulled in um in a way that you're describing like you saw with the the, the motorcycle mm. not in the sense like i'm not i i it's not very easy for me to suddenly decide to do uh, wet plates and i actually don't think i'm it's funny I'm not saying I'm worthy of it, you know. And it's Bullshit. not the right word, but but um, come, I, I come visit me. I'll, I'll have you making wet plates by the weekend. I, I have a gentleman okay, well, from Can Canada coming in this month, and um, and he's going to come in, and I'm going to teach him. I've taught many photographers, so yeah. if you know, you just be careful what you wish for because well, I got you. Th this yeah. rabbit hole has got no bottoms. Right, I mean, I, there's I, no I bottoms. Have, yeah, I might have to drive out and visit you. So, but. yeah, I would. I would but, love that. I could show you the process in person. We could. We could have a summit. And I'll, oh, I'll, yeah, I'll join you. Yeah. It's like a, it's a 12 hour drive from here. It's I get yeah. to. I, I get to drive my new car all the way across the country. But but um, it was something intangible, and I and I I was hoping I could explore this. It's it's it probably doesn't have an answer, but there's something intangible about the process that I think you picked up on that drove you to what you're doing now and pick, I have picked up on looking at your work. That's we, driving me to want to talk to you. We don't, but I don't take, know what that is. we don't take photographs anymore like this. We don't compose photographs anymore. Nobody has any damn skin in the game anymore with a digital camera. And again, I'm not knocking any, any digital photographers listening to this. Just Hear me out. I'm an analog photographer practicing a 175 year old photographic process. It's my duty to give you my slant. And that's, that's all I'm doing. There's no right or wrong here. Mine is not better. Or this is this isn't my process. I'm just telling you, it does. It, it's going to be rather boring if I don't talk about how I feel about this process. OK, right, right. so we don't compose photographs. I, I shouldn't say don't, but many times with our iPhones, let's just say, let's take professional photographers out of it altogether and we won't upset anyone. Right. I'm talking about people with their iPhones. We don't compose photographs. We don't have any skin in the game. It doesn't cost you anything to take an exposure. You just take exposures, you take exposures, you take exposures. And what are we all hoping for? And I'm, I'm just as guilty, but my only other camera I should explain is my iPhone camera, by the way. We just keep taking exposures over and over and over. And we're, we're, just, we're just praying that we get something that we want. That's not the case with the wet plate collodion photographs. These are 10 seconds of exposure. So that iPhone opened for 1 60th of a second. My normal exposure here with the natural light coming from the sun is 10 seconds, 600 times longer to make this photograph. We got heartbeats on the plate. We got a couple shallow breaths on the plate. And what's most glorious about this image, and maybe that's what you're picking up on, Antonio, is that there's a thought on the plate of my sitter. And that thought and all that life gets transferred to the plate somehow. And these are 10 second movies. These are not still life split second you could argue this is no part of my life is on that plate. You can't argue that with a wet plate. And you may say, well, 10 seconds doesn't seem that long. Well, 10 seconds is a long time. I've seen full adults wither under a 10 second exposure, not moving. I got head braces in place. A bunch of coaching has to be involved to get these images that you're appreciating. It's, you know, anyone who's listening to this can go ahead and set your camera to 10 seconds and um, take a picture of a human being once and mm. tell me how that goes. It happens, it's, yeah. it, it, it's a, it takes practice. Um, it takes forethought. Um, it takes some coaching. Um, and it just takes a desire to do something that's not, um, you know, is, isn't the easiest thing to do. I think that's what I picked up on because you, in the, in the picture that you displayed on, on the frames group, you mentioned, all the technical stuff, the exposure and, mm -hmm. and, and and everything about it, and I think what I locked onto is the when you said ten second exposure, 
And I gave that a lot of thought. And and I realized what you're talking about, it's it is a moving, it's a moving still image, right? Yep. It's, um, yep. Uh, not a still moving, it's a moving still image. And it was something about that 10 seconds and looking at uh, the gentleman's face and uh, he's not looking at the lens, he's looking down. And it, it occurred to me that you are capturing part of someone's life and uh, and they're giving you 10 seconds of their life. And, and that is now permanently on this thing. And there was something about that that, again... It's not rational, I think, which is what, what I love about your work and this kind of work is that there's there's nothing rational about it. It is emotion altogether. At least that's how I'm, I'm experiencing it. It's uh, it's something that I don't necessarily have words to do, and I probably ought not to have words for it because it's not meant to be put into into words. It's meant to be experienced. But anyway, I really wanted to, you know, see if uh, you know find out what that magic is, and maybe we. Maybe we're not meant to. Well, it. and it, it is magic. And, um, you know, any um, advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So I have a box of Kleenex in my dark room. And that box of Kleenex is not there just to blow my nose every once in a while. That box of Kleenex is I have complete strangers break down full crying in my dark room. Not because, let me, I gotta, I gotta say this, not because I'm a, the best photographer in the world it has nothing to do with that. There's something about this process that does that. I don't take any credit for that. But what I'm saying is when you have someone come in and they're, when's the last time you shoot someone a portrait of themselves and they just break down in tears? Um, you know, it's just not, it, it doesn't happen every day. And um, if I could do anything for digital photography, um, I would, have every exposure cost a buck. Mm. And I think we'd take a lot less exposures. And at the end of the day, and this is just me again, not to insult anyone, I think we'd take a, a lot more meaningful exposures. We spend just a little bit more time if it just cost you a, a buck. So there's just some skin in the game. You know, they, photography hasn't always been this way. You know, back in the days of films, I mean, you'd have to buy film and the film costs money. And then you'd have to go get the film developed and that costs money. And, you know, where you buy your papers. I mean, there was always you always had some skin in the game. We don't have any skin in the game anymore. And I and I it's just my it's uh, after thinking about this a, a long time. It's just what I've come to the conclusion. And, and I'm just as guilty as anyone else when I when I grab my iPhone and take some behind the scene photographs. I, I never take any serious work with my iPhone. So some people sometimes will say, well, I like that photograph. And it's like, well, that's not the work. That's just me mm -hmm. clicking the shutter to, <laughs> to kind of show you maybe the color variations or the translation between. Because it's really fun to see the difference between reality and what the wet plate does. Because it, it it blurs reality in a little bit. It's, it's very resolute, like we talked about. It's very honest in one hand. But then on another hand, the way that it, it manipulates colors and, and, you know, then you have the, the depending on the focus and stuff, you, it's just reality. Sometimes it's just so much there. And then other times it, it kind of um, gives you a false reality. So it, there's again, something intangible, but something that you know, that's obviously noticeable if you're paying attention. And I, and I, and I just love that. I, I just love that. I mean, you can take in wet plate and, you know, you can take a, a $2 Halloween knife, or a $2 bowler hat from a Halloween costume, or the cheapest bowler hat in the world. And that could be the most magnificent, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you would think that that's like a, a, a bespoke, handmade from rabbit's fur felt bowler hat. And my first bowler hat was a buck 50, by the way. That's how much my first bowler hat cost. And you should see how it photographed. It photographed beautifully. So you can take these hoiky kind of, I don't even know if that's a word, but these, these cheap kind of things and you can make something much more grand. So everything becomes more grand. Like the process is give, is handing mm -hmm. out grandness mm -hmm. at will. And, and, and these, this grandness sticks. I don't know if that made any sense whatsoever. It makes no, perfect it, sense. Perfect and sense. it makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, you sort I of hope I'm answering your questions. Oh yeah. Actually, you're, questions. you're actually going, you're, you're just plowing through them. Um, so yeah, you're answering questions we haven't even asked yet. Um, but so, okay, so you started in 2012. You built the darkroom and studio in 2016? 20... 17, I think 17. I came in. Yeah, 17, 2017, yep. And you described your, I mean, in my mind, it's like you're a pioneer, like the Collodian photographers of old. 
you did your uh, you did what you had to do in order to support the process. I don't think there's anything, you know, you know, and now that you actually that you called yourself a photographer, which is great. Um, uh, you know, it's all, it's all come together and, and it's, you know, we're all benefiting from, uh, uh, from your output, but I'm just wondering, uh, you're living with this process day in, day out. You're clearly a thoughtful guy. There's a lot of work there. There's a lot of thought and philosophy around it. And, and you're, sh- you know, you're sharing, you're teaching, um, you're actually, you're sharing the studio out a day a week. You still doing that? And any, it available? Uh, any, any day other than Friday. So I'm, I'm my studio day is Friday. I still got to run the shop out at my business Monday through Thursday. Um, and with the date the, the studio opened up here, I vowed I would never work another Friday. So um, every Friday is my creative day. My brother runs the shop. I give him Monday off and it's been like they were both on four day work week. So, so any other day other than Fridays, and I do sometimes like on Wednesday, this Wednesday, I'll have, you know, 14 students in Bismarck state college there, but if there's any other day, I've made this studio completely free of charge available to any artist, painter, sculptor, you know, I've had documentaries shot in here, other photographers. Um, I have a young photography lady that actually has a key to the door and she just comes in and lets herself in, lets me know if she's going to be in here and, one rule, just leave it as you found it. Um, it's never let me down. And I just have this philosophy that um, the more creativity that I can put into this space, just the more, the more meaning it has. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. almost like the create, it's, it's bouncing off the walls in here. Like you just bring, bring, um, you know, uh, singers in here, or whatever you have in any, someone's doing something creative. If you want to shoot a documentary in here, come in and shoot a documentary. You want to do an interview in here, do an interview. If you got a, cl- a headshot you have to do for a, cl- a corporate client, come and use the natural light. Because I'm telling you, this light, you know, the, the, there's nothing like it. There's not. I mean, I read a book from 1906 by a Dr. Raymer who wrote like a definitive book on building the best natural light photography studio available. And the whole book is dedicated to building a studio. And I, the, these glass in here is... I took the diagram, the pitch, the size and everything from this book from 1906. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, I read the whole book and I said, okay, well, this, I think this will fit best with my floor plan. And we, we built this, um, you know, I built the studio with this natural, these lights, it's skylights and, and, and window lights. And what's really interesting about that, I don't know if you understand this, but um, wet plating uses, um, it really is strong towards UV. So ultraviolet okay. light, it, 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 it loves that. It's a, 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 a much of the image is created using ultraviolet light. So um, I was once given a demonstration out at the University of Mary at my TEDx, that TEDx you talk, you talk about, mm-hmm. just right when I just got done with that TEDx, that night I went out and there's a bunch of students that wanted to get their pictures taken. And um, it wasn't even a night. It was still, they had this 50 foot wall of glass that was, facing the sun. The sun was coming through 50 foot wall of glass. You can about imagine it looked like I was standing out, out, outside and I mm-hmm. set my sitter down there. I did my thing with my camera. I did my focusing and I was looking at the ground glass. The ground glass is a good lie to me. It never lied to me before. Right. And I got no exposure whatsoever. Oh, the U, the, the UV film, oh. the UV film that stopped the art and the, the couches from getting faded and all that stuff. This, 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 Either there's, I've learned that it's either two panes of glass with a gas between it, or there's actually a film over glass. So all modern day glass, none of that will work for what I do here. You might as well put a brick wall up if that's what I was going to do. So it took me six months to figure out where am I going to get glass? Try to find a piece of glass today with no UV protection. Hmm. There's 3,500 pounds of greenhouse glass sitting above your head if you come into my studio. And greenhouses want as much natural light into the place because if you have more natural light, your plants are going to grow more. I mean, the last thing you're going to do is have windows with uh, UV protection in a greenhouse. So that's where I had to have, I found a place to put together greenhouse, large commercial grade greenhouses. And that's where I had my custom glass. So it's, it's, um, you know, 3,500 pounds of um, wow. tempered um, non uh, of greenhouse glass that allows 96% of the UV into space. So my art in here, my carpets are fading the whole, but it, <laughs> it, it, again, it doesn't matter about any of that. Right. It doesn't matter yeah. about any of that. I, I need, I need that light to create. This is, I just want to interrupt for a second. Um, that there's an irony to what you're talking about. I know your studio's got this glass and you're using this old technique. And we were just talking about before that you're, creating uh, these these images on glass and uh, 
photographers from the past were actually making negatives. Yep. And I think I heard this story that after the Civil War, there were so many glass plates, uh, uh, glass plate photographs left, but there was not a lot of glass that people were using them to put in their, to create greenhouses with these glass negatives, which faded over time. There was a um, there was a story I just saw on Facebook just five months ago where they were renovating an old building in the United Kingdom and the windows in the bathroom or something were um, for negatives back in the day. Right. Negatives back in the day. So, so. it just struck me as is interesting is you're using greenhouse glass to create photographs and people have used photographs to create greenhouses. Let me let <laughs> me tell you something more interesting about this. old. I'm, I'm using silver, right? Yeah. My, my images are these images behind me are made of silver, right? I mean, the image is completely made of silver. Is, is silver innate to Earth? Not as far as I know, but uh, it's not, right? It comes from. Yeah, from yeah. there was very good. You're you're the it's, only it's, person it's, that's it's ever a, answered from, that from, properly, from, Antonio. From the stellar explosions. Yes, stellar explosions. Yeah. Yes, but uh, so they all the silver. There was never enough energy here in the formation of Earth to create any of our heavy metals, our golds, or nickels, or platinums. All of these heavy metals had to come to Earth from extraterrestrial bodies colliding with it, and that's why we have pockets of gold in in San Francisco and up in Alaska. Um, it just you know you don't just dig down more and get more gold. I mean, it's it's debris that was spread here, and and to think that these images that are sitting behind me and all the images that I've ever made are made from this these particles that rode here on an asteroid or a meteorite or a comet. Mm. Um, it's just uh, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. People, you know, you just take for granted that the the silver ring on your finger. Um, was just found, you know, in the bottom of some, you know, river or something. It's it's not how it, it's not the reality of it. The reality of it's always brought here from somewhere else. So think about these images coming to this planet billions of years ago mm. on other extraterrestrial bodies. I love that. Um, let's let's riff on this a little bit because you talk about this um, a lot in in pretty much everything I've seen of you so far. Uh, but the long the longevity of the images and the longevity of imagery in general and uh what 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 brought you to this concern about things lasting for forever or as long as possible what's um and i, I asked that because i'm worried about this too and i've oh. gone off and thinking about digital and thinking like this stuff is not going to last. And you listen to my TEDx talk, right? I mean, I, I did, I but I, into, I was already into, thinking about this before. I've been thinking about this for a long time, and I'm actually, I'd love to even like hang out with you and talk about this some more and see what we could figure out. But like, it worries me because I've got you know 1,500 hard drives here with all my archives on it, and I got boxes of slides here, which will probably end up in someone's garage at some point, you know, in the future maybe. But they're slides and and they're physical. But all this stuff here. And unless I print the things and, you know, I don't know how, how practical it is. So I, I always think, of, I know, I know I have to, I see you the Epson print printer it. behind you and I got to get mine fired up too. And yet, is that our only choice? I mean, you know, our only choice to, for, for, for maintaining this visual archive that we're going to have in the history. But anyway, I want to go into like, what, what is it for you? Why does this why does this mean something for you? The longevity of, of of these of of these objects that you're creating. Once I figured out that they were going to last forever, all of a sudden I wasn't making these images for us. I wasn't making this image for me. I wasn't making the image for the person that's in the image. I was making it for the people that came after us. And maybe it's the oncology nurse in, in me and hand holding the hands of many 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 people um, over the years um, that brought me to this realization that none of us are getting out of this alive. And um, what a what a cool thing it is to be able to leave like a little time capsule of yourself, and, and it does just has to be a plate, and these plates will be around. So um, you know, and they'll be here long after I'm gone. There, I don't know. I, I find some solace in that. I find some. I find um, I find meaning in that, and. and um, I tell the I tell the students too. I said, you know, I tell them if you find if you do a photograph, you don't have to do this for every photograph to answer your other question. You have to do it for every photograph. But if you take a photograph that means anything to you, you better bring it into the real world and print it. And I don't, you know, I'm not going to 
you know, I don't care what kind of any, even if you use the cheapest printing method possible, it's better than nothing. Because I tell them, I said, you take your cell phone and my cell phone's got 15,000 images on it. And I weigh that with a, with a scientific scale and I get a, a value of how much that phone weighs. And then I go delete my 15,000 images and that phone is going to weigh the same amount. And that hmm. logically tells me that they don't exist. They don't exist until you bring them out of those zeros and ones on these long data files. You have to bring them into the analog world so you can throw them in the air, tear them up, put them in a drawer, whatever you want to do with them. They don't exist until you bring them into the real world. So you got to find those images that are important for you that you want to get on into the future. We're not like remember my TEDx talk. We're not inheriting these shoeboxes. Well, if I was your son, Antonio, I would be <laughs> inheriting stuff. But normally, I mean, it used to be that every family would have a shoebox of photographs right, right. Or, or, or that they were handed. It's not happening anymore. My son's, I mean, my son's 17. He's not going to have a shoebox of photographs for his kids. So what's going to happen? I mean, you talk about that and I, I you know, I've, I've gone to um, antique shops, the, the box with all the old postcards and it said, buy an ancestor, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, I bought five ancestors and you mm -hmm. know, I, I keep them around here. That's not going to happen these days. And, and, mm -hmm. and I just wonder if uh, like this attitude that we both have, we're fighting an uphill battle a little bit because oh, absolutely, absolutely. How many people are really going to print? I think I need to print books, right? That's going to be the way I'm going to sort of archive my work, I, unless I get a new printer one of these days. But I mean, that's I, that's my plan. I haven't done it yet, yeah. but I I feel something about this potential loss. Like you know, we have all this information from history, from old photographs and prints and then scratches on walls and 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 you know uh, pigment on caves and yet we've got this we're in this time period now where other than photographers and creators like you who are creating something permanent the rest of us perhaps it's going to be this dark ages in the future i wonder about and, and it, so it, it will it absolutely will and and you spent all that time making those damn exposures antonio so I, I, gotta, I, I don't mean to be rude, but what's the point if you're not going to, if they're not going to come to life? And he, here's the other thing. Even if you gave them to the future in digital form or whatever, which they're not going to survive, I, I, I can guarantee. When I talk to the State Historical Society of North Dakota and they're going on seminars all over the country trying to figure out what to do with their digital archives and they don't know that state of North Dakota does not know how they're going to leapfrog these, this digital content that they're receiving in their archive 100 or 200 years in the future, they have no idea. Don't think that you're going to sit around at your house and figure this out, okay? And even if you did figure it out, you're not going to be able to afford it. So to preach to the converted, um, you know, you have to you have to print these things out. I mean, it's and you don't want someone else to print them out either for you at some point. You know what right, I mean? You don't right, want to misrepresent right. no, it. Absolutely. They, you were the photographer. The world deserves, and, and I'm going to, I don't know you well, but I'm looking at you and I say, the world deserves for your work, because I know you spent time on it and energy, right? Mm -hmm. yep. It deserves to have your work printed somewhere it, it, by you. And I know that's a tall task when you have, you know, um, Michael Lalonde here in town, he's got 65,000 images that he's taken over his lifetime. He's, he's been a photographer since he was five years of age. He's 76, wow. 77 years wow. old right now. Wow. So what, what he's got to, you know what I mean? Like I sat down with him and about four years ago, I said, Mike, I don't care. I want, he, he shoots um, birds and, and wildlife. I said, Mike, I want a hundred of your best images. And he spent months grabbing a hundred and we made him a book. Really? And we have, oh. a, I have a book. He has a book and his family has a book. And, you know, I felt so much better at the end. And we got the state historical society in North Dakota a copy of his book because his dad was a very, very well-known photographer here for the Bismarck Tribune. And, um, and it was a great moment. It, was, it wasn't the whole 40,000 images, the whole catalog. I mean, I, I think that's that's like you're talking about that. That's probably not practical. Right, but yeah. there can be a selection process. Here's the other thing, Antonio. Who in the hell is going to select these images, the best of them, if it's not going to be you? Right, right. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> Who's your answer? I mean, yeah. if you're not going to make a folder right now and just start Antonio's favorites or something and just start <laughs> yeah. throwing shit in there. 
how am I going to go through? So I, so let's just say I was some photography expert archivist or something. I'm going to come into Antonio's collection of all your images and, and make a determination of who you were as a photographer. Mm -hmm. Bullshit. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go, let's go back to, uh, let's go back to the plates again. Um, I wanted to ask, I had a question and now I can't find it. Uh, 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 well, where, actually, before you get to that, go, um, go ahead. while we're, while we're in the passion of the creation here, um, <laughs> uh, well, no, and, and we're very much in the moment when you're, you're very much in the moment when you're creating these in the 10 seconds and the, the process and, uh, the reaction, the visceral reaction to your sitters, they see they see the image come up in the in the tray um what do you, what are your future plans then i think it's in the in the documentary or no it was in the forward to the the first volume of the mm -hmm. uh of the aboriginal your aboriginal subjects you're saying uh, uh I'm, I'm sorry i forgot the gentleman who wrote the forward said that you're working on this project of a lifetime where you're doing you know, m multiple books of these images of these, mm -hmm. uh, of these Aboriginal people. Four, 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 four volumes of four, over a thousand images. So I'm trying to get to a thousand Native American portraits and every 250, I'll select my favorite 50 images going back again to Antonio, the whole selection process. I couldn't, these books, these volumes of books, if I would have put all 250 images in this book, the book was going to cost like $245. I'm like, I can't do that. I mean, nobody's going to buy a $245 book. I'd be doing it nothing for just for myself. So I pick 50 of my favorites. Everyone's names in the back. So all 250 names is in the back of each volume. But I pick my favorite 50s. Again, going back to my argument, who's, who's better to pick who I am? You know what I mean? Like, Right, right. You, you can't. The other thing that we should tell everyone is you can't. You can't like every image the same. I mean, we all have been doing photography long enough to know that, uh, you know, like this is my personal favorite, and and I don't need any justification. It's just my personal favorite, and and so there's a selection process, and so there will be four volumes, um, you know, that are we're, we're on January volume two will be published. So um, we just are doing the final edits right now. One of the gentlemen I should talk about, you know, we were talking about earlier why I do this, Antonio, is one of the gentlemen, Jason Two Crows, just passed away on Saturday. Mm. And he's one of the 50 images that I selected for my book months ago. So the family calls me um, very distraught, distressed, obviously, a gentleman's, I want to say he's 57 years old, passes away. Really? And very unexpectedly. And what his brother, um, Darren, relayed to me, um, the first thing he asked me for, he says, Shane, we, we'd like some, you know, prints for the, the, the funeral. But we also, I need to know the names of the places where his plates are. And we were very fortunate that I got one plate at the State Historical Society in North Dakota, which was for my series. And the other one went to the Pitts Rivers Museum in the United Kingdom. So wow. both of his brother's plates are in these permanent archives. Wow. And he, I'm, I'm just getting goosebumps telling you this. Yeah. Um, he found a, um, some comfort um, in the fact that his brother's images were in these prestigious, I mean, the Pitts Rivers Museum in the United Kingdom, I mean, that's, I mean, that's cream of the crop, um, to know that his brother's portrait is sitting in an acid-free sleeve on some shelf in that facility and indexed, gave this man some comfort. I, what, what more can I do as a photographer? I mean, I don't, I don't want to do any more either. I mean, that right there, that, this whole scenario, the sad development that just happened and, and, and the fact that he's going to be in my next book. It's not like I said, oh, I'm going to now I'm going to put him in my book. He was already selected. He's in the book. Mm -hmm. And to know that, um, you know, that he's no longer here at this age, at his age. Um, I don't you know, there there you go. There's the there's that chance of mm -hmm. someone seeing your picture 500 years from now. I mean, who's, we don't all have that opportunity. And I'm trying to give that opportunity to every person that trusts me and comes into my studio. And I just happen to be very fortunate that I have these archives um, that that are taking my work. State Historical Society of North Dakota, 700 and some plates so far they have of mine. Oh, really? That I many? Mean, wow. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I've, I've made 4,100 of them in the last nine years. Um, they, they've got a large majority of my work. Um, I mean, who's got the, that ability where their archive, their state archive, like puts their arm around your shoulder and says, Shane, whatever you give us, we'll take. Nobody's got that. Not that, not, not and I'm not bragging. I'm just saying, I, I'm telling you this because I don't want to take it for granted. And I, and, and if I 
say this out loud to you that how fortunate I am, <laughs> maybe that's going to, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, um, yeah. It, it, it's, it's my way of saying thanks to them. And, but I can never take that for granted because not, not everyone has that ability to have their work archived in the way that I've been um, luckily been able to. Um, but, but then again, it was, it's, it's a lot of hard work and I've, I've never asked for any, any money for um, these plates either that I'm giving away. So these are, these are gifts I, I consider it a gift from my studio and a gift from the person in the photograph to these archives. The, you know, as you're saying this, I'm thinking this whole thing is is bigger than you, right? This whole process that you're doing. The, the I'm too I mean, close I don't to know Antonio. I'm just, Tam, you know, Antonio, I, I'd have to leave it up to anyone else that's looking at me from the outside. I, I am way too close to my work to know if any of it's any good, to know what... You know what I mean? Like what this will mean in the future. I've had people tell me, people that I respect, historians. Um, Clay Jenkinson has uh, told me, um, Dakota Goodhouse has told me in private some how they feel about what I am doing. And people can tell me, and I, you know, I'll, I'll, I can listen to that and acknowledge that, but I'm just, I'm just so focused on what I'm trying to do next and to make that next image. I always feel like I got all this time to maybe soak that in or, mm -hmm. or, 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 or analyze that later. But the fact is like, we don't know, like, I don't know. I could go get in a car accident tomorrow and, and then this whole thing comes to a quick abrupt ending. So um, I shouldn't take that for granted either. Well, how about this? Do you, do you think that um, this process, this creation of these, uh, that you're in control of them or is it in control of you? I don't believe I have a choice to create right. in That's this what process. I think. Yeah. If, yeah. I, if I, Antonio, if you told me tomorrow, for whatever reason, something happened on earth where wet plate collodion photographs can't be made anymore, I'd stop taking photographs. There's something about this process that it, I can't, I can't get away from it. And don't, you know, I've, I've done contact prints, Van Dykes. I've done other photographic techniques I, you know, just, I've watched other photographers do them. I got no, I got no freaking interest. I got no interest. If it's not this process, I am a one trick pony to the core. This is all I got. And you know what I mean? I'm like a simpleton. Like, this is what I got. This is, I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to ride this. It was given to me. And, it, you know, um, mm -hmm. I can't feel too bad that it wasn't given me too late. You know what I mean? I was 44. Would I have loved if my dad have put his arm around me and, at nine years of age, let me show you that I, you can make wet plates, son. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, what that would, would be I have some done? Dad, right? No. <laughs> I mean, well, you know, my daughter's making plates, so I saw um, that. I saw that at the end of the show. Uh, yeah, like mentioned so, that she was making that portrait of you. In, independently, she took uh, on Father's Day. She, I never had taught her. Like, you know, when when this, uh, um, Jamie comes in this um, from Canada this month, and I'm going to teach him the process over the weekend. I never sat down and said, "Okay, Abby, just grab a pen." This is what you do first. This is what you do second. She'd just been here by osmosis all these times. Really? And, oh. and she just was paying. And maybe she made this determination some time ago that she was going to do this. And, and she was paying more attention than I thought. But it wasn't. I never. She, I came down and it was like, um, you know, with the, the three bears or whatever. You walk in your house and you know someone was there. Like, <laughs> who in the hell has been in my studio that I didn't know about? And here's these wet plates of my daughter sitting there. Mm. And I didn't make them. So there's only one other person that I could think of that in the world that could have made them. Are you sure it was? That's was, great. Uh, That's Abby walked down here at 17 years of age, completely independent. Mm. Had the chemicals, got them together, you know, got to the loaded, the, poured the plate. I mean, it's not um, for the faint of heart, this process. It's not. Um, that's so and, great. And that's why you see most of the photographers that practice this are journeymen, 20, 30 year photography wanting to pu push themselves. You know, you're not some moron who's never owned a camera trying to trying to you know have his way with this process i mean there's there, there should be easier ways to baptize yourself into <laughs> photography um yeah than, with like the road than the road i took less dangerous chemicals and yeah <laughs> um there's three pictures that i, I wrote down in my notes that i kind of wanted to talk about um we got time uh we have as go, much time as you want we have I as much care, time, and i i oh man thank you so much um the first picture is uh, the your your murderer's gulch image, mm, okay. and the reason why I resonate with that because I am a big fan of the Jacob Rees image bandits mm. first, and especially because yes. I walk by, you know, the area where it's taken. Oh yeah, yeah. And I've always 
I've always, especially because New York, right? So I'm from New York, mm-hmm. and and so that has a lot Fabulous. of feel for me. There's also on a side note, this there was a show on um, on uh, was it TNT or AMC uh, okay. called The Alienist. I don't know if mm. you were able to mm. see it, and uh, it's a it's a it's a twelve episode or ten episode story. It's about uh, it's episode it's not an episodic. It's a serial about. You know, um, three people in old New York in the 1890s, I believe. Okay. Um, uh, hunting down a murderer. It's a murder mystery. Oh. But they set it in that time period. And the second season, there's one episode where a, where a sort of a shady guy is walking through a, an alleyway. Yeah. And they mimic that photograph. Oh, that's in fabulous. A, in a I got to find that image. now. Yeah, I was like, and I'm looking at them I'm like that's Bandit's Roost. Like, I, and I, I played it back for Elizabeth, my wife, and we're looking. I'm like, look, and she's like, I don't care. <laughs> but yeah, that's like what this. my wife says too, Antonio. Yeah, yeah. and it's that's not what an my wife exa- says too. It's not an exact duplicate. It's just enough that I said that's Bandit's Roost. I knew that. So like, anyway, so when I saw your creation uh, of this uh, image, and I just want you to talk about it a little bit because it's a, uh, it's, it's an interesting story. Um, yeah, I was just I was glued to it, and especially because, also, you know, you talked about um, I think you talked about this with a Barry X on the Candid Frame about the the story about the the amount of crime that happened there, and yeah. it was, it was yeah. worse than Deadwood, and, and, and yeah, whatnot. absolutely, yeah. So, there are fourteen. I just was in that alley just um, two days ago, showing someone uh, a new acquaintance that that piece, and then we just walked a couple of blocks, and then we saw the new installation of No Vaccine for Death that we just put in 90 people, 18 months of planning. So Murderer's Gulch has a special place for me because that was my first large collaboration where I thought, okay, let's step this up a little bit. Enough of this one picture at a time or one sitter at a time in my studio. Let's let's see what we can do with them. Find some makeup, hair, wardrobe, set design, and let's see what we can do. And and when you you bring a group of, and, and the reason why, I mean, we don't, we didn't, copy Reese's, you know what I mean? Like we have right, to find right. an inspirational image because I have to express to these people that are, a lot of these people aren't professional. We're not a bunch of professional, you know, people <laughs> getting together, right? It's just no, some people no. that on Facebook said, I'll come Shane. Um, <laughs> it's that kind of thing. So you have to, you you have to visualize, you have to, you know, you have to say, this is, this is what we're going to go for. This is, this kind of gives the feel. And, and mm-hmm. so it was a huge honor and it was our big, large collaboration. And we've done quite a few of them. Um, so far but yeah it was a uh, um you know 14 people um linda slaughter i yeah her name was linda slaughter um was, was had a house across the street from murderer's gulch in downtown bismarck and she documented like 14 people being killed really um, wow. over these these so many years in the, in that area and and the fact that um when we uh, when we did murderer's gulch uh a historian from the state historical society or the bismarck historical society did like a little talk about it, for, you know, to kind of get us all um, jazzed about it and, and and talked about that the police wouldn't even go in, in into Murder's Gulch. So there was a private um, from Custer. OK, so Custer's Cavalry came over and got drunk in Murder's Gulch and got into a fist fight or something or he, I think he was killed. And Custer sent the 7th Cavalry into Murder's Gulch here in Bismarck to to find and uh, dispatch of the bad guy. So, I mean, that's amazing history, right? Did they find him? Did they, you know? I I think they did, yeah. He he reported that they did, yeah. Yeah. There was gunshots involved, but there, you know, there's the prostitution ring there and there was the the bars and it was a very, very seedy part of town. So, um, and, and, you know, it was a little challenging too, because I mean, the city of Bismarck had to give me permission to use an alley for an entire day. Um, and uh, the mayor, uh, Mike Seminary, said yes, no problem. And he was on hand that day. And but you know, you're you're, you're celebrating, you know, something a bad CD part of history. And, and some people say, well, I don't want to remember that part of Bismarck. And it's like, that's yeah, not it's just that's part. Not, of it. That's not the right attitude. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like it happened. So if it happened, let's report it. The Holocaust happened. Let's keep right. reporting about that. Mm-hmm. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? This isn't like, oh, let's just put this in the past. That, that, that's not how history should work. We should, it, it's not, we weren't celebrating the murders. We weren't celebrating the prostitution. We were celebrating that this town came from that. Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, look at where we're at now. So, 
I don't, you know, looking back in history. So yeah, it was, um, it was a wonderful, I, you know, I got to uh, my first creation with Merrick Doyce, the, the film director out at the University of Mary. He's my director, been my director for all these large collaborations. So um, every time that I'm doing these large collaborations, he's in charge of moving people around and stuff. And, and, and it is like a movie set. I mean, absolutely. Describe. Absolutely. Well, there's one difference. What? Zero budget. Zero budget. We got zero budget. <laughs> That's great. I mean, there's no budget. <laughs> there's no budget. I mean, we got we got negative budget. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, but for people to come in and and everyone gets paid. You know how they get paid? They uh, get a signed limited edition. Print oh, right. Yeah. Wow. Well. That oh. nobody else gets. So there's a special print that I have printed up. Um, 11 by 14 prints of all these and then on the back it has everyone's name who was involved and then i i make so many prints as everybody who was included those go out to the people that were in the actual this last one like i said there was 90 prints went out wow. 90 people that uh, collaborated with us and then um yeah and that's so you come out and spend an entire day spend weeks planning getting your outfits and all that stuff and then we do that one image and then the other thing that i promised to pay you with is that the image goes up the state historical society your name's on the back of this piece of this plate that says that antoni was here on this day creating with this motley crew of of, of people and it, it, you know where, where where else is this happening you know what i mean like it's a pretty cool thing it's you're getting really me cool you're getting thing. me excited that i might have to like there's a drive out there. <laughs> yeah there's well a you can be you can, you can you can be uh you can be part of any one of the collaborations um herb asherman um a platinum printer from uh, Cleveland, Ohio, a very good friend of mine, befriended me, so found me just like you found me, just found me out there online. He's come in three times and he was, he's in the, he came, flew in to be one of the people in, really? in no vaccine. Yeah. And then I had mm -hmm. Catherine Segura, a wet plate, my wet plate sister, a um, young lady I'd never met and talked to before. She flew in from California to be in that picture. So I've had people come from all over the place to be in one of these large collaborations. So. Yeah. Um, speaking of these large uh, events and stuff like that. You you went and um, photographed uh, during the, um, the uh, protest of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Yes, standoff. Yep. Uh, yep. That's in in Standing Rock, right? Yeah, Standing Rock, correct. And you know when I saw the pictures in again, it was in the documentary. And I saw the shots, the images, excuse me, that you created. Mm -hmm. It really reminded me of the pictures that you saw, like Alexander Gardner or Brady during the Civil War when they would photograph sort of the either the aftermath of a battlefield or while it was happening mm -hmm. and all those little blurry figures moving. And were you aware that you were like, did you have any kind of like connection to that past no. of what was going on? I had was... a connection to my friends that I had already mm -hmm. been photographing Native Americans or that they needed my help. That's the connection I had. So um, obviously I know about Brady's work and I know about Orlando Scott Goff's work and 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 so forth but um um how were the picture how how was it how were you going to help them with with your, with I was, your injury? I, well i i got i got the pictures on the front page of the fargo forum um they they went all over the place there was more than one news article mm -hmm. picked it up it was on i don't know if it was on dateline there was actually a dateline there was a, a short video of showing it wasn't about me but it was showing the dakota access pipeline and they talked about they they mentioned they shot showed me with my old my wood camera really? and stuff yeah, on the yeah. set and stuff so it's uh, made it in other places so um i just knew i needed to be down there i knew that um that my friends were coming in and they were upset about whatever was happening down there and i wasn't going to be that guy that was going to continue to ask these uh, the, these people to come into my studio and not stand with them. There, there's absolutely, I would have to have abandoned my Native American series and there was no fucking way, excuse my language, that I was going to be doing that at any time soon. So um, I, it was just more of a uh, call to duty or something like that. And it was, you know, it was really early on too. It wasn't like when there was all the tear gas and stuff. It was, I got a photograph of there, the, the sheriffs lined up and some of the vehicles knocking down stuff. Um, it was, um, I have one of where there was a, an elder was talking to the crowd and stuff. Um, yeah, I didn't, it wasn't as romantic for me. It was more of just, Hey, my friends need help. I'm going to come down here. And then I make those images available to whatever cause, um, they needed. I, I got a lot of flack for those images. Um, oh yeah. Like what? Like what? Oh, Why? I mean, I've, well, because I mean, this was not a popular, this was not popular here in North Dakota you know, the majority of North Dakotans did not want, uh, did not stand with, um, with the tribes and what they were, 
what they were trying to do. And because I mean, you were photographing the, the whole scene, they the, the people who were giving you flack thought you were siding against something I'll, rather I'll than give, being... I'm gonna I'll give a quote. He's the photographer that photographs those dirty Native Americans. Hmm. That's just one one wow. thing that I've heard about me. Um, so, I mean, they, it's not yeah. surprising that, like, my Greta Thunberg image was, you know, um, was and vandalized that's next, here. Vandalized that's the next thing I want Britain. to talk about, that that image of her, um, or the images. You did several of them. And, um, uh, and, and again, you talk about that. There's, that shows up in the documentary. But what was that experience like? And, and tell, us, tell us about the after effects, like what is going on. You're, there's so much power in... Well, it's just good to say there is so much power in your images. It's not just like you're taking, like you said, it's not a digital picture. It's a thought out, long exposure, capturing time of somebody. And, you know, there's thousands of pictures of, of Greta all over the place, but somehow yours is drawing this ire from those people. So tell us about that whole experience. A well, bit. I mean, people called me right away and said, well, you got to get Greta. She's coming to North Dakota. You got to get a picture of her. And I'm like, well, <clears throat> sure. I mean, do you know her? Do you, how, how do you, how do you, how do you uh, propose that I, I figure out how to get a hold of Greta Thunberg, one of the most um, famous young females in the world and get inside her camp and get, you know, even five seconds of her time. How do you propose I do that? I didn't have any way of doing that. And then um, I learned that she was coming to Standing Rock. And again, we go back to these relationships. You know, I was down there in Standing Rock and, and I helped my friends. I've been capturing the people of, 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 of that area for years before that. So it was these friendships. So I made one, one phone call down there uh, to my friend, Jen Jewett, who works down at uh, Standing Rock, um, not Standing Rock. Um, she works uh, down at Sitting Bull College. And I said, if you can give me 15 minutes with Greta, I'll get a picture for the, for the tribe. And she says, well, let me, let me see what I can do. And I get a call back a couple hours later and says, you get your 15 minutes. So this is 15 minutes of time they took from the elders. This is 15 minutes of time they took from the, the students and the mm -hmm. kids and the children and the whole society, the whole, the reservation, the people of, of Standing Rock um, gave up 15 minutes of their time with Greta Thunberg so that I could do what I, I, I could uh, by capturing her down there. And it was really important to capture her on Standing Rock. That, that, that was, it was really important. She came here for them. She didn't come here for, you know, to visit with the mayor or, you know, visit with the governor or anything like that. She came down there to stand in solidarity um, with, the, with the Standing Rock people for the same reasons I went down to Standing Rock to, you know, in, in, the, in the first place. And, um, you know, those are famous last words give me 15 minutes and I can do something. I mean, that's, you know, I, I've got, I'm going to Standing Rock and um, I've only got 15 minutes to capture a wet plate uh, of Greta Thunberg. I mean, yeah. if I if I told you gentlemen tomorrow, you're going to Standing Rock, you have to be down there at 245, bring your digital camera, but make sure you only have enough memory to have one photograph because you're only getting that one photograph. That's it. You get mm -hmm. the one photograph. Um, so I show up down there. Do you want to hear this part about me? Yeah, yeah, going? yeah, please. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, they said, I want to say the times they said, okay, Greta's going to meet you at three. I said, okay, great. I get with Chad Nodlin, my, my, um, I have an official digital photographer from, from my studio. He's a good friend of mine. I don't pay him. He gets paid in, in Cherry Manhattans when he comes in and, <laughs> but he captures everything behind the scenes. And he was in here just this last Friday, by the way, very good friend of mine. I got him together because I knew I wanted to capture some other shots of her, the making of, and then my daughter. I was not going to go down to see Greta Thunberg. My 16-year-old daughter was 16 at the time. There's no way she wasn't going to get to meet a 16-year-old girl um, like Greta Thunberg. So we jumped in the car. So we're going to get down there at 11. We're going to leave at 1130, and we're going to drive down Stand Rock. It's like 50 miles or whatever. We're going to have plenty of time. I'm going to sit Abby up in the tree or whatever. I'm going to get her. I'm going to do some test shots. I'm going to know what the sun's like that day. I'll get everything done. We're in the car. We're just leaving. So we got three hours. I got three hours. It only take me 45 minutes, an hour to get down there. I'm going to have two hours. I'm going to be all set up. Everything's going to be great. My phone rings right as I'm leaving. We're moving it up to oh, 130. No. One, 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 145, I want to say is what they said. So I had 
58 minutes or something like that to get from my business to Standing Rock and get set up, no time for test shots or nothing. I mean, I got everything together. Greta comes walking out of the building, like just within moments of me getting everything ready. I, there was no, you want to talk about gut checks. I mean, I have no idea of F-stop today. I have no idea of what exposure that I'm going to be doing. I have none of that. I have to just sit there in the sunlight and just pray for something. Like I, you know, it's this much of a, uh, the sun gives you different amounts of UV every day. It's, you know, there's overcast, there's clouds coming in. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things and I'm going to get this one shot. It's all I'm going to get. So they came out and then to add um, stress to me, her, her dad says, yeah, we only have time for one portrait. I was thinking I'd have two. She said only one. So I thought, okay, if I'm only going to get one portrait of Greta Thunberg, um, I'm going to get a documentary piece going back to my native American stuff. Like I wanted, I can't play too much with her, her, her image. I've got to, I've got to get a piece that looks like Greta. So everyone identifies that as Greta. So I set Greta's butt down in a, on a chair and push her back into a fern tree into a um, evergreen tree to kind of get some natural. My idea was to get some nature in there. And I took that one photograph. I call it Greta. And um, as the plates coming up, so I've got Greta to my left, underneath I'm down on the ground the trays on the ground I got all my chemicals on the ground Greta's kneeling next to me and her dad Savante a very wonderful gentleman is standing next to me and I pour the fixer onto this plate and this image of Greta just comes to life and I and I nail this this exposure mm. so as good as you possibly can and I understand I'm working in a portable dark room as well that little bark room I told you about so yeah, I'm doing yeah. all this going in this chemistry and all this stuff so I not not the best of circumstances and there was this collective whoa like that's what I heard from Greta and I heard that from her father and I saw my opening Antonio I saw my opening and I said I looked up at Savanta and I said can I do one more <laughs> and he looked and he looked down at me and he said absolutely <laughs> and that's when awesome. I got my second exposure and I got to do standing with us all which was Greta standing there with the backdrop of standing rock and that I mean um has to be the most viewed modern day web plate of all time with over 3 million shares and likes on social media. Wow. Um, wow. And, and, and the rest is history. So um, Greta told me that she was going to share the work. Um, she didn't tell me when, and you know, it was, she was here in America. It was a big deal. Remember when she landed and then she left and all that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But the, the, the day she landed was really big, but the, 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 even a bigger day was when she left, like Greta's leaving now. And um, the last thing she posted about America was my wet blade of, Really? Her. And wow. so she wow. saved it for that last moment. And I'm telling you, it was just like, it was crazy. There was, um, and then I decided that I was going to give a gift. Um, you know, I was doing these large prints at downtown and I was going to do one on a bakery of Greta Thunberg standing for us all. I thought it would be, you know, something nice to give. And, and the, again, these aren't, um, I'm not sucking from any art fund or, you know what I mean? There, there, there's no fundraiser had to be done or nothing like this is just me saying, okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to do this for my, my city. This is where I was born and raised. I'm proud of this place. And, and to put another piece of art up on the wall. And um, the, the threats came. And then um, the boycotts uh, started. And then um, my mom was getting coffee downtown. And she looked over at Liberty Trudges Through Injustice, which was my other large collaboration where Lady Liberty, based off uh, Liberty Leading the People uh, over in the Louvre. Um, and um, they egged um, Liberty Trudges Through Injustice. And so a hundred and I want to, at last count, it was 168 newspaper articles and um, stories were written around the globe about this, this aching of vandalism really? of, my, of my work. So these vandals did me a, a grave favor, um, a wonderful favor. I mean, I couldn't have hired a promotional company to do what they <laughs> did for me. Um, and then, um, oh so Greta wasn't, I had to call and uh, the city had already approved it. It was going to be approved. There was no issues. And then I, I couldn't do it to the bakery. I just could not, they were going to boycott this new bakery. And I, I just couldn't, I could, I can take flack for my work and I've taken, like I explained to you about my Dakota access pipeline for, um, work before I've taken flack and criticisms and stuff like that before. And I can take that all day long. I got, I got broad shoulders, but I can't ask someone else to take it. So mm -hmm. I had to abandon that, but within like two and a half hours, um, a gentleman from Fargo called me and said, we're going to do it here. Really? And mm -hmm. so Greta, the installation went from Bismarck to Fargo. Then I got a, uh, there was a place in New York that installed it. And then one went down to Standing Rock. And then there was, there was another uh, place that bought, uh, that purchased one. So there was four 
um, large installations of Greta installed around the country um, instead of just just the one that would have been here. You know, yeah. like 300 people probably would have seen the one here in Bismarck. And right. but then now look, then, at, this, then, yeah. then, now look at this and, and now you have I mean, the day that it happened, the, the following day, there was a company in France blew Greta up on the side of their the world's largest um, a, a digital billboard on mm -hmm. the side of a skyscraper. Really and had Greta there for the entire day. Greta, through oh. my web plan image was, it was like um, eight or nine stories tall. Wow. Wow. My, my web plan and Greta was on the side of this, this big, huge building in solidarity. Two million people drove by it that day. All from someone <laughs> throwing some eggs, that, this, yeah. throwing some eggs and stuff. So yeah, it oh, was, um, um, it, it, you know, I can laugh about it now and it, but at the time it wasn't funny and it was a very, very difficult time for me, but mm. um, I have some really good people in my life that helped me put it in perspective and telling me that you know if, if this is what you're if this is what your work's eliciting you're doing you're doing something right mm -hmm. um that the, the, there has to be um you have to be doing something right so um that's where i'm at and, and it was it's a bit amazing and um there was a an exhibition one of the plates so one of the promises that i had made to um Savante and greta was that i would not possess these plates that I was not going to keep these plates that I would find homes for their plates so um and I couldn't have found I mean the Library of Congress took one of took wow. uh, Greta Thunberg standing for us all and then the Nordiska Musit in her home country took the plate of Greta so both plates found these museums and Greta actually went over there was an exhibition over there where they blew Greta up large and in, in, in this museum and it was a Saturday and my phone text came across in this picture of Greta standing next to this installation over in her home country and her dad had said, thank you from Greta and I for, for doing this. So, you know, this is, this is a year, year or so later after I met them that they were still, um, you know, what a gift. very gracious. Yeah, and yeah it, was wow. just, it was so cool to see that, that <laughs> she had, she went to, to the museum because she heard that that police was there of her and she went and stood by it and her dad took a picture of her. That's fantastic. He, wow. They sent it to me. So um, it's all good, but um you what know, a fifteen minutes you had with her then, <laughs> or, or a little? Oh, it was, I mean, it, was it was, it was, yeah. it was, it was amazing. Yeah, I, I think it was about twenty minutes when it all said. And yeah, done. yeah, wow. And she just got in a car and just left, and I was just like, the plates were still dry. She Greta's gone, and the plates are still dry. And I just remember sitting in the because I you can't really move these plates until they're dry because if oh, you really? bump them yeah. or anything, yeah, yeah, they get they can get marred. Or even if you change the environment, like if I start them drying in my car with the air conditioner on, I can't take them outside in the heat if they're not completely dry because you'll see a hesitation mark. Oh. And I learned this lesson the hard way a long time oh. ago. So I sat there with my two pieces of Greta Thunberg until they dried. It was like 40 minutes of just like <laughs> just sitting there, just watching them, making well, sure that they dried and then getting them back to my studio and scanning actually, that, them. And that, that's an interesting link to, I'm getting close to uh, wanting to wrap up, but, um, and I could talk to you for more time, but I, what do you think, what do you think your sitters get from having their images, their person captured by your process, by the wet plate collodion process is like, do you think, is there a common experience? And I know you've posed yourself for your daughter and even for, for self portraits. What do you, what do you, what is the common experience you think they, they all come away with? I, I hope, and, and, and they tell me this, it's a sense of pride. It's a, it's a sense of pride in, in, um, in having their regalia, and their traditions and their likeness captured um, like their ancestors did mm -hmm. years before. It's under different circumstances, I understand. Most of the Native Americans back in the Victorian era, they didn't understand what was, you know, happening, um, you know, with their images or what, you know, they, they had no ramification. They didn't understand what was gonna, what the photographer was really doing. How could you really understand it? I mean, you know, um, it was such a crazy magical kind of process. It was, it was hard to put your head around, but, um, so, you know, they, they come to me and, and, and they seek me out. It's all been word of mouth. And, and I, I hope I give them a sense of pride. Um, I hope that I show, um, I hope I show Edward Curtis wrong that Edward Curtis thought that, um, you know, they would be gone by now. Um, uh, you know, and I, I hope I've proven him wrong. I think if Edward Curtis could come sit with in my studio on a Friday and watch me make wet plates, cause understand I was making, I'm still, I was making a process 60 years before what he was using. He was, you know, yeah, he was after the turn of the century. Yeah. yeah. So he was in 1903, yeah. 1906 or something like that. So he was doing dry plates. He would, you know, he would think 2021, there's a guy taking wet plate <laughs> photographs 
of What's Native Americans yeah. in regalia? That's impossible. I mean, I, I would, I, I romantically think that that's what he would think, that he would have a smile on his face. Because I really believe with all the problems that people have had with some of his work, um, that I think he had all good intentions. I, I, I think he just was doing the best that he could at that time. And, and, and you know, that's what all I'm doing as well here. You know what I mean? Um, I told her, I, I have a hard time. Sometimes people judge, they've, they've judged some of these previous pioneer photographers for, um, you know, conceptualizing or, or romanticizing, you know what I mean? Like the, the, the Native American on the bluff with the, you know, with an eagle in his hand and, and, or the, the maiden in the stream, or, I mean, you're not just having your large format camera there and a maiden just happens to, a Native American maiden just happens to walk by and, and go in, you know what I mean? Like all of this, the process demanded that you compose it. You know, mm -hmm. the, the horses and the Native Americans dry, walking in the fore, in the background. I mean, you can envision Edward, bring them around, bring them around boys. You know, we gotta, you know, I didn't get it the first time. I mean, you're not just gonna be sitting there with your large format and a, and a plate ready to capture whatever, it, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And and so when I, I push back a little bit of the criticism when people say, well, you know, they were, um, you know, they romanticized some of these things. Um, yeah, sure they did. Um, but you, you have to with, with these kind of processes, you can't, it's not candid. People could forget how difficult um, these long for large format, long exposures were back in the day. Yeah. You said in, in, uh, I think in the documentary that it's kind of a dance that you have with, uh, with your with sitter. sitter. Yeah. Yep, it's a dance. Absolutely. And I'm, you know, um, and, and they've got to do their part and I've got to do the part that I do. And, and in the um, acknowledgments in volume two, um, when it comes out, you know, one of the last things that I said in there is that um, all we can say is that we've done our best. You know, that, what more can we ask for? Like, I, I just, it's something to that effect is that, you know, we, we're doing all this and all we can say and all we can ask for is that we did our best at this time. And, mm. um, and that's how I feel about it. Um, Am I the best photographer in the world? Absolutely not. Um, uh, but I, I keep striving. I keep trying to improve. It used to be large jumps and leaps in advancements. And now it's little baby steps. And, and, and I never want to, and I've said this before, I never want to pour the perfect plate. I never want to do that perfect exposure. There's no, there's no such thing. It, that is a, um, that is a falsehood that just mm -hmm. doesn't exist. I don't want to have that first exposure. Maybe that last day that I'm down in my studio when I kill over down here, maybe I can do that last exposure that day. Then you can give it to me. But <laughs> before then, I just want to, um, I want to keep striving, trying to do my best. Mm. Then, that's all I want to. That's all I want to do. Yeah. This this phrase popped up somewhere, uh, either in the doc or someplace else, and it was, uh, "You don't take a wet plate; it's given to you." Mm -hmm. Can I say, me, I say that quite a bit. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, you know, everyone, I'm going to take your photograph today, Antonio. I'm going to take your, I'm going to take your photograph and you don't, you, you don't take anything. This process, you know, it gives you what it wants to give you and you better pay damn close attention to the process and you better listen to what, you know, you better follow every rule um, or it's not going to give you anything at all. Um, you just, it's almost like it's meant to be sometimes. Some of these images are just meant to be. And, and sometimes how they come about with happenstance and, and you try so hard, you know, you strive so hard for one image and, and it, maybe it doesn't turn out. And then another time it just happens just naturally. So, um, you know, it's, I just kind of be, I try to be humble and, and you know, um, just keep, what you have to do is you got to keep trying. You got to mm -hmm. keep taking the exposures because you're not going to, you're not going to find anything without taking the exposures. Right. And when I work on a, on a Friday, you know, we'll, um, you know, I'll do five or six plates all day. You know, I worked eight hours last Friday and we had five plates to show for it. So eight hours, the first plate took us three hours to compose. Mm, wow. um, and um, it was based off uh, Muka. Are you familiar with the, the painter? No, no. He, he did um, like floral patterns with women and stuff like that back in the early 1900s. And uh, so it, uh, it's based off Muca's Rose was the, but what we worked on. And um, we brought in hundreds and hundreds of flowers and, 
and I had to get my camera above the sitter that she couldn't be. She had to be laying down and trying to make her look like she's standing up. It was it was very, very self-involved. Mm-hmm. But I will, uh, you know, I'll have digital photographers who come in and take 800 photographs and I'll take five. Um, there's just there's just something different about it. And I don't I don't care about convenience. And the thing about convenience is about the process is um, I don't know anything else. So the, the convenience never comes into play. Like if I only told you this, this is the camera that you have to use in this process. That's the only way you can make photographs. Well, you're never going to like be envious of, you know, one sixty of a second exposures and, you know, right. snapping, right. you know, hitting, right. you know, hitting burst on the shutter and getting 70 pictures in three nanoseconds. I mean, you're not, you, there, what, what's there to be envious of? You don't, I don't practice that. I'm not, it's not, all I know is this. So there is no hindrances. I don't, mm-hmm. and I, you know, some people have so long and then they got to hold still and then it's so expensive and all these reasons people are throw at it that, you know, and I'm like, well, I don't, that's the only thing I know. So it's the only thing I know. I, I can't be, uh, I can't, uh, it, it can't be a hindrance to me. I try to use these hindrances if you want to call them hindrances, which I don't, but if you do, uh, these difficulties, I just try to use them to my advantage and, and yeah, play yeah. within the bounds. I've got, it's a very, very concrete process. You don't, you skip anything or you do something out of the ordinary. You don't get the results that you want. Um, so you play by the games, the game that was described and the process that was described and you sure you could tweak things and do things here and there. Um, but you know, if you, if you work within the boundaries of the process, it's such a beautiful process. Mm, yeah. It's so underrated and people don't, but you know, people, they, they, they know me. Uh, m- most of the people know my work online. Like you said, you've never seen one of my original plates, but when they come into my studio here and the first thing you just open up the door and the light comes through and, and you're just, there's hundreds of plates on the walls here. Um, people, what a common, um, a common theme is that, that they, they, they feel like they've never seen my work before mm, wow. that, that, you know, in the digital realm, because understand I have to scan these things. Yeah. yeah and these, yeah. these are, these are glass images made out of silver. I mean, it's like, you know, scanning a silver spoon. I mean, I, I mean, it's very difficult. It's that you, the, the scans and the students will come in when they come in on Wednesday, there's these big prints. I got glass tables in my dark room and there's these big prints, of my native Americans in the glass. And then they'll, you know, a student will say, well, I like that one. Like you said, you like that one picture of that one gentleman. And then I turn to the student and I'll say, well, that's not my work. And they'll say, what do you mean? It's not your work. And I'll say, well, that's not my work. And they'll say, well, you took that photograph, didn't you? And I say, yeah, I took that photograph, but that's not my work. And I'm trying to mm. trying to elicit from them to understand that that's paper and that's an ink or whatever process that I used to get that. It wasn't, you know, it's not a historic process that I did these prints in. So it's, it's a, you know, it's a modern day process that unless it's silver and glass, it's not my work. It's a poor representation of my work. It's almost a shadow of what you took. It, it's not, it's not my work. I mean, I can go today, I can go to Walmart and buy a Van Gogh. Right. I mean, there's Van Gogh's at Walmart. I, I can buy a Van Gogh at Walmart tonight. It's, is it a Van Gogh? I'm not comparing myself to Van Gogh. I'm just saying, I'm <laughs> yeah, trying to make that, I'm trying yeah. to, uh, under, yeah. you know, explain this to the students that that's not my work. That's a print of my work. Yes. And you can appreciate it. And yes, you can get a good idea of what the work is, but until you hold that very heavy piece of glass until you can hear it hit on the table, um, you know, it's, it's not my work. So it's yeah, yeah. Um, just like a painter would say, if it's not paint and a canvas, it's not my work. Well, that's the truth. It's a print of, of some painter's work. And, and I can, I can see that. And that's why, I, and I just, it resonates with me for some reason. It, it's an important detail, especially to tell these young kids, because understand gentlemen, they don't know anything but digital. Yeah. Right. I mean, they got no, analog. No. I mean, they don't even have analog music. I mean, when you come into my studio, when you come visit you guys, you're gonna we're gonna listen to records. We got <laughs> you know, there's gonna be little <laughs> poppings and little cracks and all the imperfections. Mm-hmm. And and I, I tell them that the, the process is imperfect. Okay. We know that. Okay. Mm-hmm. There's all kinds of crazy shit can go on with this process. It's very difficult, process and perfect. Photographer, absolutely imperfect. I can I can vouch for that. This photographer is imperfect. My sitter. I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb. They're imperfect as well. Okay, you get all these three imperfect things together. Sometimes, every once in a while, you get something perfect, and that's what I maybe what you see in that photograph that that particular photograph that you like of mine or any other works. That if something, and we don't have to like all the photographs the same. I mean, I don't like all my work, and the more sure. I make my work, mm-hmm. which is really funny, the more I make my work, the less I like my work. 
So I, I, I like my work less all the time. <laughs> it's just I, so. I'm trying to understand that, but, but uh, okay. You know, I like my work less all the time. Yeah. Like I look at the, you, you, you saw book one. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. yeah. So. Just book one. Yeah. That's book yeah. one. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I can look through there and I, some of the images, I just, I, it's just my perspective. I, like I said, I'm too close to it all. Does that make sense? It's not yeah, for me to say. Cool. It's not yeah. for me to say. Yeah. It's, it's no, I have no business. I can have, I can have, obviously I have my own opinions and I can like my favorites. You know what I mean? I'll tell you what my favorites are, but what I find out is most of the time my favorites. And that's why I like when what someone wants to do a story or something on my work is that I, I give them a whole bunch of images. Like mm -hmm. they, they, they don't, well, you only need five. Well, I'll give them 50. <laughs> and then I let them select which five they pick. And then I garner some information from that. I learned something from that. If I respect the, you know, the, the, who's selecting and all that, even if I don't, even if they don't have any curator, um, you know, uh, abilities, at least I'd learn something like why uh, those 50 and all, I'm always befuddled. I'm like this That's one, yeah. this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. All right. Shane, I'm going to, I'm going to call it a wrap tonight because um, this can go on forever. So I, I want to yeah, know. Yeah, well, we could. We well, can I want do to be this able again. To have you back. Yeah, I want to have yeah, you back. I, yeah, yeah, I promise to talk more next time too. Because yeah. <laughs> you went, please, we started with question one, and you answered five of my questions basically. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm just gonna let you two guys roll, and I'm just gonna sit here and take it in. Yeah, and uh, I'll, and I'll come up with some. I'll come up with some intelligent questions next time. Yeah. I'd lo well, love, love to be back on. And again, from from my from my person to your person, um, your work moves me in ways that I haven't been moved before very many times. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's not just your work and it's the people who have sat for you that are also giving me this. So, um, reach out to them when you can and say that, uh, that I'm feeling the, the energy from all of you, uh, including yeah. these images. They're given and, to me too. They're given to me. If they wouldn't yeah. come in, what would I, what would my work be without them? Right. I'd, I'd have nothing. I'd be sitting right. there doing a bunch of self portraits. Yeah. My yeah. family. I mean, I, I get, you know, you can only do so many portraits. So many of, right, family. Before they say enough. Right. But yeah, uh, I don't want no, no part of this, dad. Yeah. So, so let them know for me that uh, I, I, I I am thankful I for all of your, your, your work today. So, well, I'm uh, thankful to, for the opportunity to just for you guys to listen to me. And I, I hope I didn't ramble on and I was able no, to no, some, this is some insight into, you know, some of my thought processes and, um, yeah. I don't I don't know how I find myself here, gentlemen. I have no idea. But I, I do feel, feel very fortunate. I mean, some people some people go their entire lives and don't find that one thing that um oh, that's true. Yeah. That yeah. They, they can hand their hat hang their hat on and, and I found it and it, it's not gonna change. I I've been doing this for nearly a decade now and I I will be doing this until I can't do it any longer and, and there's something reassuring about that and that, that there's going to be a body of work that's going to be left behind and um, that some of these people at this time that trusted me are going to be remembered and, and people are going to get to see their portraits long after we're all gone. And, and I know, I know it sounds corny and it sounds maybe, no, it's not you know, uh, um, I just, not that's just how, just how I feel about it. It's just yeah. how I feel about it. Well, um, I really appreciate you spending uh, your time with us tonight. And um, what's the best way that someone can find your work? Is, is it going to your Just website? go to Google. Just go to Google and type in Shane Balkowicz, B-A-L-K-O-W-I-T-S-C-H, wet plate. And there's, you'll find all the articles. Everything. You'll find my wiki page out there. And there's a couple of websites that I have put together. And, and, um, and I definitely recommend the, uh, the documentary that's on uh, Amazon Prime. Yep, on Amazon Prime. And then the second book, um, the first book um, is sold out, but the, the second volume um, will be available in January. And um, I'm really excited about that one. Um, I, I think you're going to see it. You, you, it. There's this steady, hopefully steady path of improvement by me. Um, and you shouldn't improve, damn it. I mean, 4,000 of these plates. I mean, at some point you got to get, you got to do something right. So, um, well, yeah, well, I'm enough, very, if, I, enough Shane's take pictures. Eventually you get, you know, you know right. more Shane's take pictures that you get a picture of uh, William Shakespeare. So I mean, that's a bad, you know, you know what I mean? But it's like, 
you will get there. But uh, let me know when that book comes out on on frames because I want to order it from you. Okay, so. I'd love to get your copy and get it signed for you. And, and you too, uh, Ward. Thanks for absolutely. Thanks for the absolutely. questions and stuff. And yeah. it's an honor, gentlemen. No, and and you. I'll uh, let me know next time you want to come on. I'll be more than happy just to hang out, or if you just want to guys want to talk, um, we can just do a, a Zoom yeah, session. Just have. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So anyway, have a great night, Shane. Okay. Thanks. Wow. What, what, what a discussion that was. And you know, the opening quotes to the show are from Shane. So I want to make sure I get some of his, his quotes in there. But, that was uh, amazing. I don't know if anybody knows anybody like him in their lives. I don't know what else to say. No, He's and, an and amazing, he, amazing guy. And certainly a force, you know, I think in the, the kind of photography he's doing and, and the 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 effect he's having in his community there in, in uh, Bismarck. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm really appreciative that he spent so much time with us tonight. And uh, the, the, the plan is we'll have him back on the show, we'll, um, especially when his uh, next book comes out, or at least give him some time. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll, you know. Let the media of, uh, stuff uh, whittle down a little bit and yeah, we can talk yeah. to him. And and maybe we plan to go visit him. You know, I could do I could do North Dakota. I could do North. Well, I don't know. I'm not going to drive out there. Although it'd be kind of exciting to drive out there, but <laughs> I don't think so. I don't know. That's a long that's a long haul from here just to go. So maybe I'll I'll fly in or something. But it was great speaking to him. It was great to give him sure giving was. Th that much time to us tonight. So I promise next time to talk more. Uh, you guys were just in it. <laughs> were we? We were in it. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. I'm a little starstruck still. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you know, it's th that process that there's something. Um, there's something that he's bringing to the process and, and the passion, um, and it's it's very evident in how he's describing what he does, and and also in just the imagery and the people who are sitting with him. There's a passion all all throughout the process, and so mm -hmm. I think I'm very much in tune with that for some reason. And like I said, during the show, it's sort of inexplicable. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe that's fine. I don't think we need to explain everything. So, nope. yeah. So. Anyway, cool. big, big, big thanks to Shane for, uh, for joining us tonight. So anyway, Ward, where can we, uh, where can we find you in the world? I'm on Instagram. I'm Ward Rosin Fine Art, W A R D R O S I N Fine Art. Um, I'm Ward Rosin Photography on Facebook. And uh, I have this little business called Ornus Photo. I'm at Ornus.photo, O R N I S dot photo. Any new lenses coming in? I know we always soon, it's becoming soon a thing the now. <laughs> the order's in. The order's in. I'm just waiting yeah. for, uh, for it to arrive. And when it does, you'll see the postings. They will be up there. Okay. Can't wait. I've been surrounded with lenses all my. And you need more. I need more lenses. All right. I need another. Actually, this is going to be the year where I don't have a lens hangover. So. Uh, yeah. Let's see. yeah. Anyway, yeah, you can find me at uh, AM Rosario on Twitter and Instagram and amrosario.com and Rosario Photo on Facebook. What else? And we do have uh, our, I did start our um, official uh, Street Shots Instagram and I'm totally spacing out in the name, although I suspect that if you do a search for, I'll put it in the show notes, but it's not rolling off my brain right now. We're such late. marketing wizards. That's what I know. We are. It's late night. It's 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 so late. You know. I, I know. Get up in six hours. So I promise to put it in the show notes, and I promise to remember. Last last episode, we had to have Dave tell us the name of the <laughs> Instagram account. Do you know it? Word. Um. That that no. No. See. Okay. So <laughs> we're both stuck. Anyway, I'll I'll be announcing the. <laughs> I'll, I'll, this show will be obviously promoted on our Instagram account, so you'll see it there. But go go to the show notes, and you will see it. And uh, we'll have um, uh, some of uh, Shane's pictures if he allows us to put them in the show notes. We'll, we'll, you'll see some of those work. But anyway, you just Google him, and you'll find this great wet plate photography. So, um, yeah, so that's the that's the show for the middle of uh, November 2021. Um, thanks for joining us. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I just, like I said, I sat back and watched you guys go. It was awesome. All right. Well, next time it will be the other way around. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, then. All right, All right. Ward, have a great night. You too. <laughs> <laughs>